Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We're going to give everyone just a few minutes to get into the webinar, and then we'll get started. All right, thank you for joining with us today for this IBI research webinar. Today's topic um, couldn't be more relevant, the cost of employee health and well-being, measuring the value of products and programs uh, to support employee health. Um, obviously, health and well-being has been top of mind for many employers over these last three and a half years, probably more than ever before. And it's also presented some very new challenges in a post-pandemic era for more, most employers. I think that um, while employers are positively focused on these products and programs, we are all faced with um, a similar set of challenges in that while we are greatly valuing employee satisfaction and preference, we are also being challenged with economic downturn, inflation, uh, the job market, et cetera. And so uh, our us HR folks who sit there in the middle are kind of left with sometimes competing priorities, what the employees and workforce want and need versus what the business needs are. Uh, and, and many of those are focusing back on financial concerns. And so how do we, sitting here in the middle, satisfy everyone all the time. We can't, we know this. So this is why we do the type of research we do here at IBI to help employers understand these issues, uh, what the research shows, what others are doing. And then we bring in an expert. Um, in this case, it is Jay Kular, uh, the head of benefits, health services and well-being at AGCO. Um, and Jay has been in the business a long time, as well as I, and has seen some of these challenges in the past, but also from a new view for our future. And so Jay is going to come in after we present the research and have a fireside chat with me about how they've approached these challenges at AGCO. So without further ado, I want to introduce Sarah Lee Goralal. Um, she is our PhD researcher on this project who headed this particular research for IBI. A um, little housekeeping. Sarah's going to lead us through the research findings, and then Jay and, our, Jay and I are going to discuss those findings and how she applied those at AGCO. Um, and then we are going to take questions after the fireside chat. But please, you are welcome to enter your questions in the Q&A during Sarah's presentation. And I'll make sure when she's finished, I'll be able to ask any of those data-related questions to Sarah. And then any questions for JRI, I will answer during that portion of the presentation. So without further ado, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go through this. Like Kelly said, this is our findings from our project um, on the cost of employee health and well-being. And then she and they will have a Q&A session. So a little bit of the agenda. We're going to do an overview and background um, of the topic, our methodology, findings, quick summary of everything, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So as we all know, the COVID pandemic created new well-being challenges for employers, like surging mental health issues, demand from employees for more work-life balance and location flexibility, um, a growing interest in virtual care solutions, and it also put a spotlight on existing disparities affecting minority groups. A little bit more of that background. So facing all of that, employers were in a pickle as to how to uh, approach their employee benefits, especially in 2021, 2022. So we looked at some background research um, 
as kind of the foundation and basis to move our study forward late last year. In 2021, you can see that Willis Towers Watson, they found that mental health was a priority for employers over the next three years. Um, and communication of, and of benefits was a big deal as well. However, only a less than half, maybe a little more than a quarter, believed that their well-being programs were being effectively supported, supporting their employees during the pandemic, and they weren't offering um, enough digital engagement solutions. And only 27% believe that their policies in place to, to effectively support employees with caregiving responsibilities. So it was clear to see in 21 that employers were thinking that they weren't up to par with what was needed. The same thing um, you can see here with Mercer findings in 21, um, six out of 10% of 10 employees increased their investment in well-being in 2021. Um, with 70% of employers spending more on employee benefits. And 69% were planning to customize benefits programs between 21 and 23. So what happened um, between 21 and 23? Well, things changed. So in 2021, you can see here the influencing factors shifted over the last two years, um, with DE&I dropping down the list and rising costs and competition for talent and mental health issues making their way up to the top. Um, when it came to looking at um, areas of focus for benefit strategy, cost containment remained at the top um, and meeting employee needs kind of gained some traction, but employee experience and choice and flexibility took a hit. So keeping all this in mind, were brought to our present study. So looking at how priorities and strategies have changed from 21 to 23, our research provides insight into the shifting priorities and difficulties that employers are navigating as they evaluate the expenditures and value of the health and wellness offering they're providing employees in their post-pandemic landscape. Moreover, our research seeks to shed light on how employers can strategically invest in programs, assess their impact, and adjust their employee health and wellness approaches to meet the evolving requirements of their workforce as we move into this post-pandemic reality. To drive our research, we have developed four research questions. How are advancements in digital health technology and data analytics transforming the landscape of workplace wellness offerings and costs to enhance value? What are the key challenges and barriers in implementing health and well-being products and programs? And how has organizational culture impacted implementation? How are corporate wellness strategies evolving to balance quality programming with cost management through benefit design, vendor partnerships, employee incentives, and contributions? And what evidence-based recommendations enable employers to strategically invest in programming that delivers multifaceted value across productivity, satisfaction, recruitment, retention, and other critical outcomes. So a little bit about our methodology. We conducted a mixed method study surveying over 300 HR decision makers about their post-pandemic benefits strategies. The survey also included uh, open-ended questions. There were 24 questions related to employee post-pandemic benefit challenges, partnerships, metrics, and demographics. We used Likert scale, multiple choice, multiple response formats, as well as a few open-ended questions. I also conducted semi-structured interviews of five benefit and consultant experts. They were about 45 minutes long, um, and we talked about factors driving benefit priorities, implementation challenges, partnerships, use of data and metrics, and lessons from the pandemic. Our analysis, uh, quantitative data, the, we did descriptive and top bottom box percentages of cross tabs analysis. For the qualitative data, we coded open-ended survey comments and interview transcripts to extract common themes. And we identified themes that illustrate the survey findings to triangulate the results. So to start with, I'm gonna give you a breakdown of our sample. They were fairly um, well divided among regions, as you can see. 
and they came from various industries, most of which was um, the highest percent, 16.4 being from finance and banking, but it was pretty um, well split. The employers that we sampled had employees with age ranges 30 to 45 years old at 76%. So the majority of the employee population were predominantly between 30 and 45. Under 30 was about 14% and 46 to 55 was about 10%. Our sample came from companies um, be mostly between 250 and 5,000 employees. And so now I'm going to go into the findings. First, I'm going to provide an overview of the main findings. Since this was a mixed method study, we did a triangulated analysis of the data, pulling out the overarching theme from the survey data, open-ended comments, and the interview. So mental health, big and bold, came out at the top of everything. Mental health support stands out as the top priority for investment across both the survey and the interview. But employers are thinking that they need to really find creative solutions to offer these benefits cost effectively. Another key theme was the new models of work. So um, employers are finding that adjusting to new hybrid and remote models of work was difficult and they have to put intentional policies and manager training to facilitate these transitions. In terms of measurement, um, the interview insights talked about a highlight away from focusing heavily on engagement metrics and toward monitoring, monitoring more health outcomes and demonstrating ROI or VOI for more tangible um, outcomes. The data also highlighted gaps in the communication um, and education on available well-being programs. So they talked a lot about ongoing promotions and simplified offerings to improve utilization and value among employees. And a major focus was the use of digital platforms to enhance communication. So as I said, this was a main overview of the triangulated analysis. And now I'm going to go into a little more specific data, um, pulling out some questions in particular. So one of the questions we asked was to rank the importance of goals um, in their company. So when asked to rank importance of goals for their benefits offerings, 51% stated that employee satisfaction was most important. As you can see, DE&I, competitive advantage, and sustainability were all within 1% of each other coming in for about second place, 41 43%. And then population health outcomes in our survey data was rated relatively lower in importance compared to the other category. However, in the interviews, this was seen as a big priority. So we also asked them about the most challenging health and well-being needs to address in the post-pandemic reality. You can see mental health demands top the list of pressing challenges, but a number of these needs tie back to the impact of remote and hybrid work models, which 45% of respondents said were difficult to address. These range from difficulties maintaining work-life balance and engagement, um, managing employees to burnout, and providing access and tailored support to a decentralized workforce. Then we asked about their resource allocation priorities. Aligning with this, the 51% of respondents selected mental health support as the highest priority area for investment, financial well-being, health education, work-life balance, and caregiving benefits also rank high. The emphasis on mental health aligns with the open-ended comments we found in the survey um, that frequently mentioned mental health impact and the interviews that we did further reinforce prioritizing mental health assistance and reducing stigma. We also asked our uh, employers or a sample what their approaches to health products and programs data was and how do they use that data. So the majority of them collect data related to program value and impact on a quarterly basis. This is more of an in-house informal type of um, data collection. 
more than half of their respondents conduct formal evaluations of their health products and programs annually. This is likely done by an evaluation firm to give a really big overview of the impact of their health products and programs. When we asked them what they collected, 72% said that they collect data on employee satisfaction, followed by attraction and retention rates and productivity metrics. But less than half track health improvements, demonstrating a potential for greater emphasis on tangible outcomes, as we've seen in the interview. Most respondents, about 48%, indicate that they use benchmarking moderately, while only a quarter use it extensively. In digging deeper into the measurement, we asked about um, segmenting their data by age. Over half of the respondents break down their analysis by age group of employees, which will allow them to have more tailored benefits. As you can see here, um, employees between 30 and 45 years old had the highest satisfaction with their benefits, although it was pretty stable across the board. So we also asked about what type of benefits was each employee age group most interested in. So for example, you can see that mental health services rank as the most needed benefit for youngest employees, who are also the most interested in fitness and wellness programs. However, work-life balance and health education were the most important for employees 30 to 45 years old. And over 55-year-old employees were most interested in areas like preventive, preventive health screening. What was really interesting here was that financial well-being assistance was ranked as important for all age groups. We asked the organizations how they address barriers to care in their benefit solutions. Over 50% of respondents said they conduct regular surveys and gather feedback to identify the needs and barriers um, so that they can have tailored solutions put in place. 41% said they offer flexible scheduling to allow for caregiving and appointments. And 40% said that they collaborate with healthcare providers to design tailored benefit packages to address unique barriers to care. 39% provide resources for virtual or telehealth services to increase accessibility for employees. But accessibility is um, as we've seen and heard in the interviews as well, accessibility and communication continue to um, have gaps in what should be done. So there only 32% provide education on available benefits. This was a reoccurring theme again in the interviews um, where our experts talked about training managers, simplifying messages so that employees can be more um, educated on the benefits that they're offered. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our qualitative data, um, the open-ended questions from the survey. We had a really good response rate. Um, and these are the main themes that came up. So transitioning to post-pandemic challenges, the survey comments emphasized issues like mental health impacts, difficulty adjusting to hybrid work, financial constraints limiting offerings and catering to diverse needs with finance resources was a key tension. Um, looking at partnership respondents, emphasize that collaborations improve offerings by expanding services, tailoring solutions, and providing expert guidance. And key benefits included mental health support, work-life balance assistance, and customized benefits. A little bit about the interview data that we gathered. To address challenges, interviews recommended intentional and clear policies around hybrid work schedules, focusing on skills development and simplifying vendors and programs. Ongoing adaptation through input and incentives was advised to meet evolving priorities. The intentionality was a really big um, component of this research. It came up in many um, different interviews, in the open-ended comments, there was a big push for being intentional about why you were requiring return to office or hybrid work. And um, a lot of that tied back to the meaningfulness of the work that they're doing and companies are trying to find a way to tie it back to their culture, mission, and vision.
They also talked about the importance of connecting um, health and well-being offerings back to the company's broader mission and cultural value to ensure alignment and meaningfulness. Um, over communication of changes becomes crucial across multiple channels, provide transparency and avoid confusion along with efforts to streamline vendors and simplify choices for a better and smoother employee experience. And additionally, there was much discussion on the ongoing training and tools to better equip managers um, to allow them to address well-being needs within and education, educate their employees about their benefits. Now, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I'm just gonna do a quick recap before we get into our Q&A. So the aim of our study is to examine post-pandemic challenges and costs related to employee health and well-being products and programs. What did we do? We looked at program priorities, data collection, vendor partnerships, and barriers. We did this by surveying 305 HR decision makers and interviewing experts um, and benefit and consulting experts. What did we find? We found that mental health support became and remains a top priority. There's a need to shift focus from outcomes to, to outcomes from engagement only. There are challenges in adjusting to the new hybrid remote models and the importance of communication training and change management. What is recommended? Prioritize mental health benefits, but find ways for it to be cost effective. That's like pie in the sky, but hopefully as we move forward, we're gonna get some great um, insight on how we can do this from our, our partners and employers that we work with. Leverage data and tech to demonstrate program ROI and BOI. Streamline vendors and tailor offerings to ma maximize value. Create policies and programs that are intentional and invest in training and education management on well-being programs. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so obviously this particular topic is near and dear to most everyone's hearts that is in an HR and benefits, well-being, wellness, um, even comp and Ben role. And today we are happy to have Jay Kular with us um, of AGCO, formerly of Delta Airlines, to discuss this topic. And I think that um, one of the biggest challenges that I hear from employers, Jay, is just getting their arms around what we have done over the last four years. So, you know, hot and heavy into the pandemic and and we hate to keep, you know, talking about the pandemic because I think we're in a post-pandemic era, but it has changed the way we think. It has forced us to, in some cases, put in a whole lot of product, product and programs and point solutions over a four-year period that we might not have done quite so quickly in the past Sometimes we go into that scenario without a whole lot of data. I know some employers picked products and programs that they just felt like they had to put in without an RFP. And now here we are uh, four years later, and we've got this huge ecosystem of point solutions for our employees, which now have caused an abundant amount of administration for our HR staffs. And in some cases, quite a bit of confusion for our employees and workforce. And so the first question I want to ask you is knowing what we know now and looking back on these past four years, how in the world does an employer prioritize what stays, what goes, what's working, what's not, um, you know, without necessarily doing another large spreadsheeting exercise with a large uh, consultant how do you figure out what is working? And and then question 1B would be, if you do find things that aren't working after you've prioritized, how does one go about messaging that we're taking away a program or a product? Well, first of all, Kelly, thank you for welcoming me to this conversation and hello to the our colleagues out there um, online and happy new year. 
Um, this is really interesting and very, as you know, I recently changed roles and um, and when you enter a new role, it's kind of like a very interesting to something similar to what we're all entering into after COVID. You do need to reassess because things are different. You know, our member base is different. We are different. Our programs are different. As you noted, we had to quickly act to add new programs to really be responsive to our needs and our employees' needs at the time. So um, really, I have the benefit of starting your role and starting what you normally would probably do is evaluation. I think it starts with really evaluating your landscape. You have to evaluate your programs and your products. But then when you're, it was really interesting when you say, um, Sarah Lee mentioned intentionality came up a lot in the survey, having to be intentional, but what does that mean? Besides looking at your current landscape, um, looking at, the, uh, looking at your partnerships that you have in place, but also trying to understand the employee needs. Where are your employees? Because even though we know that there's a lot of information about how um, patients have changed, employees have changed, our members have changed, we know it's unique to each individual and location. So it's getting down to those some of those really um, key pieces. You also noted that you know without having to do a big review, there is a lot of information out there. But I do say when I come back to looking at your partnerships and collaborations in place, find the ones that are trusted, doing the benchmarking, doing some of the analysis. And then that's how we get to a really tricky point. We all want to make data-driven decisions, but where's the data, right? So I think that was really interesting that came up in the analysis as well. It's true. Having to find the data, um, create the data, and there's a blending between your own customized data and then what's available and benchmarking. So I'm going to try to pivot to your second question, like how, like what, you know, how do you do that? Well, very, um, and this is not something that is just, you know, me or we have talked a lot about employee experience and the importance of surveying. And I think many employers are doing that and it's much more, we started during COVID actually. For the first time during COVID, I was allowed to ask questions of my work population employee group that I've never had before. That's the first time you were brave enough to ask, how is your mental health? We know that you are at home and you're remote now. How are you feeling about being at home? How is your connection? So that's continued. So one of the, I was fortunate enough um, that we have a very robust annual survey at Agco, but I was able to also implement an annual well-being survey. So that really informed many of our decisions and um, really leaned into some of those hearing from our employees clearly asking them the detailed questions rather than just the general questions in our annual survey. And I do have to say along the survey line, we were able to also add additional questions to the annual survey. So we'll have this cadence of being a benchmark and do the trend analysis of some of the bigger ones, and then also do pulse surveys throughout the year. So I'll stop there to let you guide me on where we want to dig in further. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting. I think we all, and I think it's great. It's a, one of the great halo uh, positive effects of the pandemic was that we became much braver in what we ask our employees. Um, I think that we we still going into the pandemic had some employers that never wanted to step over those bounds still had you know qualms about asking employees their ethnicity and now we're getting into their daily lives and they're sort of becoming more family than just workforce and that has led to for a lot of employers a much more positive work culture my company cares about me they're listening to me but I'm interested in your um, thoughts about where we landed now from those conversations, because we've opened this door wide open and certainly generationally have gotten back very different answers from our employees and our workforce. I think the two younger generations became very vocal and quite um, demanding in what they wanted from their employer, not and I don't want to just talk about benefits here, but everything, whether it's flexibility in their schedule or higher pay or more equal pay or whatever the case may be, DEI concerns. Um, and in that job market during the pandemic, 
we were sort of hostages as employers we because we we needed to hire people and have them in the workforce and not the attrition rate was just out, out outside of what we had ever seen before things are not the same now so even a year ago it was a completely different conversation so i think when i talk to employers one of the biggest challenges they have right now is finding that balance and the balance between what they are demanding and asking for in their employee satisfaction surveys and the other surveys that we're doing and our business needs, because sometimes those things are competing. So how do we balance, Jay? So, yes, it is tricky. And I think we've all as benefits and total rewards, well-being specialists have had to raise the bar a little bit. And let's talk about the pressure we as leaders have as well, which is very real, budget and resource allocation. That's really shifted and everybody's different, but we are held to the standard of how are you utilizing our dollars in the best way. So with all of that um, being said, I think another shift that occurred is we can gather the data, the survey data, but what's the response? So I know that many organizations have do this and we certainly do. If you can collect the data, now you know better, so do better. So what is the result? You have to have an action plan. If you your survey comes back that your employees have a high need for or requesting mental health support, then there needs to be a plan and it has to be very intentional. The other thing you noted is the diversity, um, generational diversity in our benefits. This is always something we've known that we should be doing, that all benefits are not the same, but actually producing the results and understanding the differences in our work groups. Many at the HR high level, ACHRO, CEO level are talking about our different work groups. And I have to kind of pause and smile because part of it is having the data analytics behind that to understand your own work group. That starts with IT resources and asking the right questions. So you can kind of be able to slice and dice your data to say, not just what the general public is saying, but really, communicating this is what we're hearing and then the last thing I'll say is when you're starting to make these action plans it is making us go more into the operational aspects so when we're designing programs it's not just understanding oh it's mental health but how do you operationalize it are we being intentional or authentic if we tell our frontline workers that you should be spending more time or taking breaks is that even possible and how do we talk and how, how do we blend it to make it really actualize it for them? So being authentic is important. And again, there's no easy answers, but it's all things before we knew all about this. This is not something that was new, but it's not. It needs to really be. Um, now we do have to activate it. Yeah, so we talked about a lot of these themes that Sarah Lee said about having the data, understanding the differences. You don't, you can't understand the generational differences within your work group because your leader, CEO, will ask you, "Well, how do you know that the new generation is asking this? How do you know we need this?" So it's making working with your partners, it, besides benchmarking, getting those getting those answers, and then being authentic in the actual solutions. Yeah, I love that. And, and, you know, it used to be years ago, we would get our pulse survey every year, you know, in my, at my employers, and then just wonder where our answers went, they went off into the ether, and we never really got any kind of an action plan or a response on it. And I think that that intentionality, and transparency, you really alluded to being transparent with employees and letting them know we heard you. We're digesting this and quite frankly, having the courage to say, we heard from a few of you about this issue. And quite frankly, it's just not a big issue for our company. We'd love to make and be all for all and make benefits exactly what every person wants from a personalized nature, but that's not reality. That's You can't scope that. It's not sustainable. And so being honest and saying, you know, if you've got a manufacturing um, um, population where your population is mostly males between the age of 45 and 65, you're probably not going to get a lot of ROI from a women's health benefit. And yet you might have a few women working for you who really want that benefit. Sometimes you can't be all to everyone. And you, it's okay to say that. It's okay to say we looked at it. We did a cost benefit analysis. It doesn't fit. 
I think just being upfront like that and being transparent to your point, it goes a long way um, if you've created the right culture, right? So you opened the door, so I'm gonna walk through it. And we had a question from the audience that gets to this same thing. We are all um, participating in this sort of redefining of the word well-being. And what I'm finding with most employers is that when companies can't find anywhere to put something, they put it under the well-being umbrella. <laughs> well-being has become this ever all-encompassing thing. Um, and and some employers aren't really set up to handle that type of a huge umbrella. And it really depends on the way you're structured internally. In some companies, well-being is, you know, one person who might actually just be a wellness coach. And now they're being asked to handle things like caregiving and financial well-being and all these other things that are way out of their scope. But I think what we're seeing, and, and I just saw a couple articles on this over the past 30 days, is that well-being is actually an umbrella that sits above benefits. It mm -hmm. it's while it is certainly benefits related and a great deal of it, like caregiving benefits and financial well-being and mental health well-being relates to benefits, what you said really caught my ear. And that is that sometimes our well-being strategy doesn't necessarily have an answer that lives within benefits. So to your example, if you tell people, you know, say you've spent a lot of money for a nice break room where people can go and relax and meditate a little bit, and maybe listen to some music or whatever the case may be. Um, if you don't give them time off the clock to go do that, you're literally shooting your own benefits program in the foot, right? So, and it may not be within your department that you work in that controls this. I, I, keep thinking about these employers that I see, you know, no internal meeting Friday, um, you know, no external meetings before 8 a.m. Don't email on the weekends. And then, you know, the CHRO is sending out emails at 10 o'clock at night. You're leaving them no choice. You're giving them this great plethora of point solutions to use, but not allowing them to use them. And so we're referring to that now as well being washing. Um, but how do you approach when these people are telling you in these surveys what they want when it isn't benefits related? Yeah. So again, it's interesting how our roles have changed. And I'll go back to something that um, I was lucky enough to be in a conference where Laura Putnam, um, author and you know well-being expert, talked about going stealth. And I was really thinking about that well-being is happening in the companies and it's okay. You don't have to have ownership. I think days are gone of building your empire. So I, it's collaboration is another big buzzword. And we also as leaders have to collaborate within our internal organizations, because I'll tell you what, Anco, well-being happens with employee experience. It happens with culture. We don't have well-being champions or culture champions, but guess what? That's integral. It is about culture. So when you look at well-being, the manager who's had a great idea to support their employees in whatever way, even though it's very localized, they're already producing some of the results that we want to see. So internal collaboration is key. And you have to have that, especially where you come with the data now arms saying, you know what, it's really important that we put together a program and I need you to find 15 minutes to get them off the clock. Because, you know, if we allow them to have this financial well-being coaching program, they really don't have the infrastructure to do it at home. I need to do this on site or my open enrollments meeting. I want to do it on site, but I'll be there armed with tablets and computers so that not only I'm talking about it, they're actually going to get it done while we're here. So collaboration is key. And again, going back to that point of, yeah, you're right. Well-being, we structure them and we have comprehensive, like we have been years of Pass, bypass this physical health, the mental, to financial, to social, to community, all of that. We've got that. But I do think it's a blanket term or an umbrella term. And there it's it's and we are actually in our roles, when we look at our changing employee group, we all have to work together to talk about that um, work-life balance. 
you know, we talk about that. And sometimes that's just something that's handled somewhere. But our communications teams are all of our infrastructure is working towards that. And are you seeing that we've all seen the language that our C-suite is speaking is very different now. And that's a direct result of COVID, whether we want to talk about it or not. And it's not going away because, you know, the ones who are really strategic, they're talking about the next COVID or the next thing, world thing that, that's going to happen. And these things are happening all around us. So I'll just pause there. That collaboration, not internally within our organizations, externally. And then again, what we can control is the integration, collaboration, the things that we do is simplify our programs to meet the needs of our employees with our multiple, like you said, plethora of vendors and partners. Yeah, I, I love that. And and I would add the last kind of piece of the puzzle, which the person who asked this question asked is, it's got to be top down. If if you have a senior liter leadership who's out there preaching well-being and well-being support, but then is not supporting the frontline managers who have to give that person the 30 minutes off to go use that well-being program, you've got a huge disconnect. And it's really hard to hold senior leadership accountable when you're not in a senior leadership position. And you can push that information back up. But when they're not walking the talk, it makes our job so much more difficult. So I've seen really successful employers who who are top down supporting that strategy. And I think without it, it does become more difficult, even if you have the best intentions. Okay, so I, I, mean, I, I yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I was just gonna throw out a tactic there. I mean, absolutely, like with the surveying, all that intentionality, it comes from the top down. And I've been fortunate to be at very employee centric companies that do that. And then the other thing, executive well-being council, it's a real thing where you have the executives that they want, it's a loop of feedback. You're also, you're sharing with them your results and your data, which is, it has to be data driven, and what you, you're hearing from the employees and you're sharing with them your plan, you're getting buy-in, but you're also getting feedback when they're saying, oh, that won't work in my group. I need to do something different. Right. So from the top down is exactly right. That's awesome. Okay. So we had another question from the audience, which is one that is also been top of mind. Um, we did research on this topic last year. It continues to be a huge source of um, challenge for most employers. And that is the prevalence of employers who are in the caregiving age group. And I think now more than ever, certainly since the pandemic, uh, we've all become caregivers in some way, even if we weren't in that sandwich generation. Um, there's plenty of people who are just caring for children at home or parents at home or both at home or a spouse or a significant other, et cetera. Um, and, and it's certainly been a focus during the pandemic, but I think now as employers, uh, well, I shouldn't say, I think, I fear that now as employers return to office strategy gets put in place, some that are going back to the office five days a week that flexibility for a caregiver becomes much more important. And so how do we continue to support those caregivers as we do return to office, if we are returning to office and, and in what way can the benefits team really support that group of people? Cause I'm sure you see that in the surveys as well, but while still meeting business goals because it's great to be able to support caregivers i'm a caregiver myself in the sandwich generation i know what the challenges are but i also know that if i've got to be taking my mom for a doctor's appointment and my son for a doctor's appointment and having that you know out of office time productivity generally can go down and so how do we balance caregiving needs well i can just start with my experience and um and I mean, there's multiple different ways of doing it. Some of the support that we put into place during COVID was indeed for those needs. And some of that has continued. But I've also really seen a great trend within our vendor partners. And they've also, when we talk about sometimes you have vendors that want to be all things and they start expanding way beyond what you hired them for. But in certain categories, they are really leaning in and understanding this is important. So we're starting to see these digital companies that are also saying, well, but guess what? We also can send that physiotherapist to your home as well. We're all digital, 
But guess what? For the for the um, employee or member that needs it, there is a part of that we can provide that service at home. So guess what? You don't have to travel to take your elder elderly um, person or your child to a certain appointment. We can service that. So you're seeing those things. I think the whole caregiving um, and health at home field has more than emerged and it's here to stay. You're seeing bundling of that happening. So sometimes the solution really is within a product you already have and it just requires you expanding it differently. That data that we talked about, <clears throat> the one great thing that data can do is lean into, you mentioned that example of maybe you're predominantly male but some of the female needs, but maybe the data is gonna show you that in one location, those female needs are really very real. That allows you to segment out that budget to say, you know what, let's just lean into that area and here are the vendor I already have in place and here's how we can support that work group. So I don't think that's gonna change. I think I think it's it's been like this all along, but we now, the way we're talking about it and communicating it, it has opened the door for us to be able to better serve those needs. So. That's what I kind of see in the marketplace. And I think the solutions are there and creatively seeing how you can afford them, how you can manage them. But the voices of our members are being heard. And I think we are continuing to provide the more creative solutions in yeah, that area. I agree. But I, I, agree. Don't to, I don't want to stop without addressing the workplace, the work-life balance, the hybrid workplace. I mean, that's here to stay. So I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, and I think um, I tried about an year, a year ago to take the whole work life uh, name out of my vocabulary because now it's just life balance, especially for those who are working hybrid or working full time work at home. It's just your life, <laughs> and and because we become ingrained in our it, workforce's personal life, it becomes harder and harder to sort of find the line between work and life and bring in the balance. So um, when we address a return to office strategy, I think that one of the biggest things we heard from employers is that intentionality and transparency above all, because we're a year ago, we were really ping-ponging. We're going back. We're not going back. We're going back two days a week. We're not going back two days a week. You pick your two days a week. Never mind. That didn't work. We're going to come back in the days we say are the two days a week. You know, that the unknown for those who had made specific commitments or changes in their life, they sold their car. They're not, they moved away from pub public transport, whatever the case may be. That was really rough that um, not knowing the unknown. And so I think now the intentionality and the transparency around that return to office strategy have become key for successful employers. I don't know why, but I just got flooded with questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to look at some of these right now. Um, first one, do you think employers prefer wellness providers that do the bundling of service, as this was to your point that you just made for them, and bring a more robust ecosystem of wellness benefits? Or do you think employers would rather contract directly with niche providers for specific services. And I'm going to mm -hmm. let you go first, and then I'm going to say my answer. Both, because yeah. I think we, what we have to focus on is the employee and the employee experience. In some case, it simplifies it to have a bundle experience, but if you know your employee group, and there's a specialized niche service that you want to drive towards, that's what you look for. And you have to, but the Delivery system has to be able to be able to provide both. Hundred percent agree, and I think the jury is out. Still, we talked a lot about data and making very strong data supported decisions in the last four years. We have put in some point solutions that don't come with a lot of data. And while we may, you know, you may have a digital solution, for instance, that has great employee satisfaction rates but we don't really know what the true engagement and and really we've moved on from engagement meaning that you touched or someone logged into your app that's not engagement that's a touch um to outcomes and so without that data to make those really good decisions this is the space we're in how do we do that spreadsheeting exercise how do we prioritize how do we weigh employee satisfaction with true clinical in nature or at least very strong BOI outcomes, right? So um, I agree with 100% with your answer. It's both. I am seeing 
a whole ton of national account size employers going back and looking at their whole ecosystem and not just from a financial perspective, but that's certainly part of it, but from an administrative, from confusion for their employees, but going back to single vendor type strategies and consolidation. Um, you know, I talked to an employer the other day that has over 200 point solutions, 200. This is not a jumbo employer, by the way. Um, and, and it's become, and that's including the whole ecosystem, you know, including their HSA and their FSA vendors, et cetera, but that's a lot. And so I think now is the time to look back, find your data um, and see what's working and what's not from all, from all perspectives, not just from a cost perspective. Um, okay, so next, I'm seeing great discussions. I'm seeing a shift in leadership focus to ask for more lagging indicators on a daily, weekly basis. For example, how many of our people are unable to work today? How many are on short or long-term disability? Are we okay with these numbers? However, there's still a struggle for who owns these metrics to impact a, po impact a positive change. Should the CHRO own these, or should we look at a new look at new leadership accountabilities? Um, that's a really good question, Stuart. And and quite frankly, I think one of the problems is that typically, historically, these uh, types of measures were very siloed, right? So mm -hmm. you've got the comp guy, the benefits guy, the disability guy, the leaves guy, maybe the safety guy, who may all really be interested in those data. Um, but A, may not get them and may not have access to them, and but more importantly, may not get together and talk about what to do about it because there may be a benefit solution in there somewhere. There may be a return to work solution in there somewhere. There may be an FML solution in there somewhere, et cetera. And so I think the siloed nature of those looking at those data has kept us from collaborating. I want to hear from Jay about how to improve that type of collaboration. So I have to say that, you know, it obviously it makes it easier if it's all under your umbrella, like leaves and absence plan management is under my umbrella under benefits, but <clears throat> doesn't mean I still don't collaborate with payroll. The real true creative solutions, because we were just talking about some of the caregiving needs. Yes, flexible work days, PTO, looking at your vacation schedule all comes into play when you look at total rewards. But the collaboration, looking at those internal partners, that's where you're going to get the creative solutions that work, because oftentimes it's not under your area of control, but it touches upon what we just spoke about, that internal collaboration. And most leadership at the C-suite are looking at these, but if they're not, you can bring that forward, because I know that in, in you know, we talk about conference board and a lot of the conference we're going to, they are talking about that. How, how do you connect the dots? Occupational health injury prevention, these are real metrics that are important to key leaders. Maybe not your CHRO, but they're important. So identifying the need to do this and this collaboration and the amount of money you can share and save if you work together, that's, I kind of feel like that's making, that's hero makers right there. That's yeah. what you're looking for. I love that, Jay. And, and I can't agree more. I think that an example that came up during the pandemic for me that just was pretty striking was um, when people were out on disability or FML um, because of mental health needs during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And they also had an associated or not associated condition that was health, also health related. So, you know, somebody who has a severe MSK disease or diabetes or heart disease, et cetera, who was out on disability and then returning to work but it wasn't their physical disability that was keeping them from coming back to work. It was the stress, the disconnectedness, the burnout, the you know sense of belonging, the things that were more pandemic and mental health related when they were returning to work. But at the time, we didn't have mental health return to work programs built into a disability program, right? So, you know, your diabetes is under control or you had your MSK surgery, time to go back to work. And we saw people coming back who were physically capable, but not mentally capable. And those in most organizations were handled by two different sets of people, those who handled the mental well-being programs and those who handled the return to work programs. And so I think that now we know what we know four years later, 
that interconnectedness and those people who are program managing those products and programs have a bigger opportunity to your point, Jay, to share the data and, and when applicable, because oftentimes when you do share your data, you're sharing some savings too, that maybe one or the other is not aware of. So that prove it to leadership that the, the cause of us being connected and sharing and collaborating is going to bring back a return is a great part of that conversation. But there's a little bit of an investment now to pay off later. So I love that you pulled that point out. So one of the big questions of the day is when we go back and we look at you know, this is, this is our set of priorities and needs. This is what employees are telling us. These are the company's priorities and needs. These are the KPIs and the goals that we need to meet as a company. When we think about um, communicating the strategy we've come up with by looking at both sets of needs, what type of communication you have, you have a diverse workforce. Many other employers have a very diverse workforce. What type of communication strategy and how has that changed over the past four years? Do you come up with, and do you communicate with pockets of people in different ways? How do you customize? <clears throat> yes, that's a good question. And I was going to say, we didn't mention it, but the big theme in all of this, when it comes to, being intentional and transparent is in the communications and how you manage those. So um, some of the um, communications methods that we've had to understanding the population at Agco, we have a ma manufacturing, a rural population. So on-site is really important. So we leaned in during open enrollment to do more on-site services, but of course we, we also have to have the virtual component as well. Um, on-site workshops and ongoing benefits fairs direct home mailers still work for a certain percentage of the population have to be really intentional that they're not all the time but having an annual mailer in people's homes really still was an important um thing that we are aware of and be especially with mental health maybe it's only once a year maybe it's twice a year but doing that and then the digital things all come into play too using qr codes to direct people using that and again we're just at the starting point of some evolving the strategy around communications, a lot more to come. We are a global company, so multilingual and um, materials, very, very important. How do we actually activate that? Um, and then the other things that are tried and true, peer communication. So I talked about champion network and um, we talked about champion network and executive councils, but building that culture champion network and talking, having a place to go to inform employees and other managers and leaders about what you're doing and communicate peer to peer really important to set up and then um having regular touch bases we talk about collaboration you have to find some vehicles through um, meetings virtual meetings or sessions or webinars and getting that information in front and aligning all your communication from all your vendors so that you're not overloading people so still back to simplicity uh, it goes without saying you know, are just we are just like our employees overwhelmed. You know, all these apps, everybody's kind of trying to get your attention. So being respectful of that, but utilizing and knowing your population. Yeah. And I think that leads to two quick closing th thoughts back to the future, but segmentation that we used to do in the early 2000s, it is meaningful and it is needed in today's environment, really understanding your population and segmentation really got us there back in the day, adding the addic uh, additive layers of generational segmentation, generational preferences, et cetera, just makes that even stronger. But if you don't know your population, you can't tailor communications to who they are and what they want to hear and how they want to hear it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, this is an ever-changing, ongoing discussion, right? Well-being itself and redefining well-being, redefining what engagement means to you as a company, how it fits in your culture, how you connect that top-down organizational layers with your benefit strategy to your employee preferences and needs is really important. And I think it's going to 
be ever evolving as we go through the strategies that we're putting in place to return to a normal work world, our new normal work world post pandemic. So thank you, Jay, so much for contributing your time and your energy and your great ideas. And we appreciate Sarah, especially for doing the research for IBI. For those of you who are attending, you will get a copy of the webinar recording for our IBI members. You will have access to the report, to the one-page infographic, and to the deck from today's meeting. So thank you, Jay. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.